All right, well, as some of you know, if you're connected with me on the socials, uh, you know this past week my wife Becky and I uh, marked 26 years of marriage. Thank you, thank you. And to celebrate, we went out to a restaurant in Morristown that we'd never been to. And we were seated and we ordered our meal. And while we were waiting for our food, one of the staff sneezed. <laughs> totally normal, right? I mean, we all sneeze, but she didn't even attempt to cover her mouth. Now, for most of us, that's probably a little unsettling. Some of us don't care. But three or four years ago, the whole place might have erupted in jeers and complaints, right? Uh, but of course, that's where this illustration breaks down, because three or four years ago, none of us would be in a restaurant uh, eating a, a meal. Uh, but uh, but Becky and I would have probably had been at home uh, in, during those years and ordering takeout to celebrate. I, I don't know actually what we did. I think that's what we did, um, ordered in. Now, for a moment, I want you to think back, and hopefully this is not too traumatic or triggering, but think back to when you uh, were out during COVID, maybe buying groceries. Uh, you were masked and everything. Uh, you, you did all the things, uh, but a sneeze was coming on, and there was nothing that you could do to stop it. You were wearing your mask, and yes, you did the whole cover your mouth with your arm and not your hand thing, but still, if there was anyone in proximity to you, you might get the death stare, right? And in that situation, the sense that you got from others around you was like, you got the COVID and nobody wants to be around you, right? Um, you were someone to avoid. Um, and, and, uh, and so it was a weird feeling. Maybe that happened to most of you. You know, when a sneeze is coming on or a cough is coming on, there's not really much that you can do to avoid that. Now, I want you to take that feeling of somebody giving you the death stare or walking away from you and multiply it by 12 years. Imagine always feeling like no one wants to be around you because in their view, you were someone to avoid. It probably, no doubt, would make you think twice before going into public, and certainly it would have a negative effect on your self-worth, but of course, in order to survive, you would have to venture out at least at some point. Well, this morning, we're going to be looking at a story in the Gospels where someone experienced just that, and everything changed for her when she encountered Jesus. Now, let me just say, when we encounter Jesus, nothing stays the same. I'm going to say that again. When we encounter Jesus, nothing stays the same. And praise God for that. Now, we're going to start a summer series through the book of Philippians in a few weeks uh, but, uh, when Brian and I return from the Dominican Republic. However, today and for the next few weeks, we're going to do a few one-off series, um, one-off uh, one sermons, sorry. And so today, we're primarily going to be focusing on the Gospel of Mark. However, this story that we're about to read uh, also appears in Matthew and Luke. The woman in the story, whose name we don't know, was outwardly struggling and likely facing uh, internal turmoil, turmoil as well. She had been bleeding for 12 years. And as you might know, Matthew and Mark uh, share those stories and each provide a unique perspective. So I'm going to dip into some of those as well. But they all convey a similar message. Let's take a look at Mark's account in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 25. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes. You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. 
And yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are grateful today that you are the healer. And Lord, each one of us struggle with various different things, physical sickness, emotional needs. But Lord, we know that you are the one that restores us in every way. And so God, we invite your presence in this place this morning. I ask God that you would anoint my words and help me to uh, preach this message. Fill in all the gaps, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there's much to say about this passage of Scripture. It's one of my favorite stories of healing that Jesus performed. And maybe it's because there's such a sense of relief that I feel for this woman who was suffering for so long. And then in an instant, she is free from suffering because she had faith. We really don't know much about her. She doesn't have a name, but we know, and I'm going to state the obvious, that she was a woman in the first century. And it might go without saying, but it's worth pointing out that women in the first century, and actually for the most, uh, most of history, have not been treated with the same respect or dignity as men or like those who have a significant societal status. And in first century Jewish, in the first century Jewish context, that that was absolutely true. Add to that, she was bleeding, and not just for a short time, but for 12 years. And we don't know the exact reason, but with our 21st century uh, understanding of the human body, I know there's some uh, medical professionals in here, uh, there might have been a problem with her reproductive system. It could have been polyps or cancer. Many things can cause excessive constant bleeding. And you you need to know that in that context, even under normal conditions, a woman going through her menstrual cycle was considered unclean. So it was common for a woman to stay cloistered until her cycle was finished. You're glad you came to church this morning, right? (laughs) But this woman in particular, as I mentioned already, was bleeding for 12 years. And there is no way that she could get away from the social and emotional and even spiritual stigma. She was considered unclean. And she had been so for a very long time. Now, I say this because from a very simple reading of this passage, one can conclude that this is an only a physical problem for this woman. But it was far more than just a physical condition. She was suffering under the press, pressure of essentially being an outcast in her community for 12 years. The emotional toll alone must have been a weight so heavy to bear. Socially, religiously, economically, she would have been completely disconnected. Now, if you're just starting reading the Bible, I don't suggest starting in Leviticus, but if you happen to read through Leviticus in the Old Testament, it details in chapter after chapter how one becomes unclean, and then how one through ceremony and ritual can become clean again. And I mention all this to illustrate how extremely bold it was of this woman to make her way through the crowd to get to Jesus. But her faith in the one who was in the middle of the crowd drove her forward. Now, none of us are likely here dealing with the same issue, but some of us have, have health issues. Some of us have had a hard time finding community. Some of us struggle socially in some instances. Some of us are struggling financially. And some might even find ourselves shunned from other religious people. Now, I can identify with every one of those, at least over the course of my life. Maybe you can too. And I wonder in today's context, in your life and in my life, I wonder, what are you struggling with? 
And what might be some of the crowds or the obstacles that, that, that just, you might just need to break through to reach Jesus and find healing and restoration? Or another way to think about the impact of this text is how can you and me help someone else get to Jesus, to encounter Jesus in order to receive what they need from him? I remind you of our mission statement here at Newbridge Church. We are a church that exists to transform our community for Jesus by providing a safe place to find love, freedom, and restoration. And some of the ways that we are doing that corporately is, as was already mentioned, our food pantry, which we ran again yesterday, our ESL program, which we've been doing now for two years, our partnership with ministries like PAUSE, our Mission 2535, or any one of our small groups. But what about you? And what about me on a personal level? How are we helping others to encounter Jesus and helping them to experience the love of Christ and the freedom of Christ and the restoration that Christ provides outside of these walls? Now back to the text, I have to wonder where her friends were or her family? Did she even have any friends or family? It seems as though she was on her own, and the empathetic side of me sees the injustice of of this and wants to do something about it. The love and the power of the gospel in Christ is for all who are given access, and God has asked us to partner with him to make that happen. The writers of the Gospels tell us that she had tried everything and no doctor was able to heal or fix the problem. And from the text, we gather that they only made it worse. And she spent everything that she had and now she was broke. Desperate somehow does not even seem adequate a description for this woman's challenge. She was in deep need of emotional and physical healing and restoration to her spiritual community. And as the saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures. And she was desperate. Considering that she had been, had this problem for so long, it was incredible that she was even still alive. But she's out in the public square and she needs help and it's crowded And that's not surprising because Jesus, as you read through the Gospels, often had a crowd surrounding him. But even for an extrovert like me, crowds can be quite overwhelming. I was thinking last summer, Becky and I were in Athens, Greece. We were on a tour of the Acropolis. And the crowds and the heat were quite literally overwhelming. Our tour guide basically abandoned us once we got through the gate and told us that we were on our own. And if we didn't meet her back at the bottom at a specific time, then we were out of luck. She would leave without us, and I had no doubt that she meant it. She was the worst tour guide we've ever had. So we had to stay together to quickly rush through. I mean, here's this like one wonder of the world, and you kind of want to like look and take pictures and just kind of sit. There was no resting. It was like, all right, we've got to move through the crowd, got to move through the crowd, and we made it. But we were pushing through the crowd, breaking through the crowd, because we didn't want to be separated from our group. We wanted to ride back uh, to where we were staying. We were focused on getting to our tour guide. And I imagine it was similar for this woman. She was desperate for a solution to her problem. And somehow she knew that Jesus was the answer. Jesus' reputation was growing throughout the region. He was healing people, casting out demons, and teaching the scripture with an authority that nobody had ever seen or heard before all over the countryside. And so when she heard about him, she spotted him through the crowd and she set out in faith to connect with him because she didn't want him to move on before she had a chance to be in his presence. She broke through and pressed through the crowd, even if it was uncomfortable. And we, and we can be confident this morning that she had to have been uncomfortable in a crowd given her condition. But she knew this was a chance for her. He was healing others. If only she could reach him, maybe her nightmare would end. 
Now, it's interesting that she was only seeking to touch his clothes or the hem or the edge of his clothing. Luke provides us that detail. She didn't even try to speak to Jesus. She said, if I could just, if I could just touch the hem of his robe. Now, this is not the first time this shows up on the pages of Scripture. There are some other biblical writers that allude to this. David, for example, used this imagery in Psalm 57 when he said, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings. And that's not a bird's wings. That's not God's wings. That is, that is the, 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 the covering of God's of, of clothing. The wings being a fringe, uh, the fringes of a holy man's tassels. The Jews, even in Jesus' time, believed that there was healing in the, in the, in the, and power in, in a rabbi's tassels. The shawl also had a messianic significance as well. And in Malachi uh, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall." And one more interesting detail about this, one of my uh, seminary professors, Dr. Brian Woodman, who's come here to preach a few times, uh, used to say to us often that, that often the Shema, which is the prayer that any good Jew back then and even today would pray at least once a day, uh, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, would often be embroidered on the fringe of a rabbi's tassel. And maybe that's what she was thinking. If I could just get after this, this declaration of God being one, then I could be healed. Now, the reality is that there was probably no power in Jesus' cloak alone. But as Jesus pointed out to her, it was because of her faith that power had gone out from him. And faith in Jesus as a healer that she had been healed. And you know, sometimes, I say this because sometimes our theology, oftentimes our theology is not perfect. I don't have perfect theology. I'm pretty sure you don't either. We don't always understand how things work, how everything works and is the best way to approach it. But because of our faith, Jesus fills in all the gaps. You don't have to have perfect theology, but you have to have faith. And you have to work to search the scripture for the truth. And, and, and you read and, and you study and you, and you go after it. But you're never going to have perfect theology until you've taken your last breath. But you exercise faith and God fills in the gaps. Amen. God calls us to have faith. And we've been talking about that here at Newbridge over the past month. As we are growing and maturing. Now, I've always found it interesting, fascinating, that Jesus asked the question, who touched me? Luke 8, 45, when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, he's basically saying, everybody's touching you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Now, do you think that Jesus didn't know who touched him? Was that an actual question, or was it a device that Jesus uses to single this woman out as a testimony of his power and his grace? I t think it's the latter. But as is typical, Peter pipes in and offers his assessment and basically says the obvious to Jesus, that many people are surrounding him, so many people have touched him, but Jesus here, I believe, is looking to draw out this woman who was just healed. Her faith had activated his power to be released, and he wanted everyone to know of her faith, but also of his power to heal. Amen. Now, in a gathering like this here at Newbridge this morning, it almost feels weird asking, but do you believe that God can heal like this today? Maybe I should back up and ask, do you believe that Jesus ever healed anyone? Okay, good. I do too. But you know, there are some traditions that don't believe that. 
And you need to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he is the healer, and he still heals. We have so many eyewitness accounts. We have the scripture. We have extra biblical accounts of, of Jesus working miracles. But, you know, even still with all of that, it takes some modicum of faith to believe it, doesn't it? But you know that saying, the proof is in the pudding, meaning that the true value or the quality of something can only be judged when it's put to, to use or tested in practice. And when it comes to faith and healing, have you asked God to heal you? Have you asked God to heal a friend or a family member? And listen, I wish that I could say he heals every time. He doesn't, and I don't know the reason for that. But the truth is that Jesus Christ is unchanging, and his plans are perfect, and he's still a healer. But you see, and, and, and obviously this is a story about healing, but Jesus did a whole lot more than heal this woman's physical ailment. He literally saved her life in every aspect. Some scholars say that the word for healed here in this story can be translated saved. One scholar writes, healed you is literally saved you. It was not simply the woman's touching of Jesus' garment that healed her for others pressed against Jesus as well. It was the faith that caused her to touch Jesus that brought healing. Yet something more happened than the bleeding stopping. She experienced physical healing, yes, but even more. Luke reports that Jesus sought out the women, woman because something greater than physical healing was taking place. Through faith, the woman also received a spiritual healing. And I would add to that a societal healing. He restored her to community with others. Imagine spending 12 years alone. He gave her a way to connect with others to earn an income. He restored her financially. He saved her in every way. And friends, I want to ask you this morning, do you know that Jesus wants to do that for you as well? This woman's faith was rewarded and Christ called her out into the crowd and declared her healed reinstating her into community and wholeness of being. As we close today, I want to emphasize some things for you to take home today. As my father-in-law calls it, homework. The first is this. Do you know that Jesus is asking us to take bold steps of faith? If we want to see God move in powerful ways, and I, I know that I do, and I believe that many of you do as well, then we have to take bold steps of faith. We have to choose in when maybe others are telling us not to. We have to do things like ask a stranger if we can pray for them and then listen to the Spirit of God to give us the words for them to pray. We have to be bold with our resources, living generously with our time and our money and our possessions. And let me tell you, you here at Newbridge have demonstrated time and time again that you are ready and willing to do that. With the pantry filling up downstairs, with all of the various outreaches that we've done over the years, random Amazon packages showing up in abundance of things that we've asked for and you just send them here and it's got my name on it. It's like, oh, it's a gift. No, it's not for me. You've demonstrated an enormous amount of generosity. And in a world that says, keep what you have and get more, so many of you are choosing the opposite. And that, friends, is bold faith. That's saying everything that I have comes from God. And I am simply his steward. I steward what God has given me. And when it comes to healing, it's bold, friends, bold to believe that God can heal that which others say is impossible. 
But there are so many stories, even in this room, where God has done the impossible. The second thing, challenge I want, to take with, I want you to take with you and, and, and ponder is I want, to, I want to encourage you, if you are the one that needs healing, to not become comfortable in your problem. Don't become comfortable in your problem. You know, we can be sick or troubled for so long that we start to think that this is just who we are. But I, I got to tell you, Jesus wants you to bring whatever that thing is to him. And he wants to transform it. You know, you're, you're not an alcoholic. That's one of the reasons why I, I like the, the, uh, the recovery group that, that meets here uh, every week, is that they, that they say, no, like, you were an alcoholic, but you're not an alcoholic anymore. You are not unlovable. You are not a total loss. You are a child of God, and our Father loves to give good things to his kids. That's who you are. Don't be comfortable in your problems. There's so many stories in the gospel of Jesus healing. And he says, he asks a question, what would you like me to do for you today? What do you need from me? And so often it takes just verbalizing, I need help. I need help. I'm not okay. To pretend to be okay when you're not okay is not helpful. It just keeps you cloistered in your dysfunction. And, and trust me, I, I, I'm, I'm preaching this because I have lived this. And I've spent a lifetime asking Jesus to give me his identity for me and not the lies that were spoken over me as a child. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be freed and restored? And lastly, of course, these are all connected, by the way, you need to know that Jesus is not too busy for us, that he has time for us. You ever stop to ponder how we, all of the human beings that are currently in this very moment alive on this earth and this spinning ball of granite rotates at just the right speed and it's just the, the right distance from the sun so we don't freeze or burn up and God is keeping all that going and yet he has time for you. He's not too busy sustaining all that we have around us. He's not too busy for you. He has time for you. And actually, if you know where the story falls in, 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 in the story of the Gospels, Jesus was actually on his way to heal someone else. The synagogue leader's daughter. But he had time for this woman. And he says to you and me, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Break through the crowd. Reach out for the hem of my garment if you have to and I will restore you. I will give you rest from your trouble. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your social or economic status. Uh, Jesus wants to restore you, and he's attentive to us all. So what does it look like to, to break through the crowd for you? Does it mean pushing past the noise of other people, the noise of your own thoughts, your insecurities, all that happens in your mind? What is crowding your way? Maybe some of you feel like an outcast this morning. Jesus wants to heal you. Will you reach out for him? Maybe everything on the outside of your life looks great, but on the inside, that one area or maybe multiple areas in which you've never let anyone see out of fear for what they might think is holding you down, Jesus wants to heal that place. Will you reach out for him? Maybe today you're in a difficult season or you're just come through a difficult season and you feel like you're starting over and I've had those times. Trust me, Jesus wants to restore you today. Amen. Will you reach out for him? 
Jesus wants to say, you, say to you like he did to this woman, daughter or son, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Will you reach out for him today? What I am sure of today is that Jesus is not afraid of messes. During his life on earth, he hung out with messy people, outcasts, prostitutes, tax collectors, lepers, and he was not afraid of them like all of the other religious people were of this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. He didn't phase him at all. And we might not be as extreme as this woman, but if we are honest with ourselves, there are areas in all of our lives, some big and some small, that are a mess. Messes that we have been unable in our own power and wisdom to clean up on our own. God's not afraid of it. And he's got help for you. Now, maybe this story is not new to you today. I'm sure for many of you it's not. But as I was preparing, I was reminded that I need to remember these truths as well. I need to be reminded of them often. No matter what adversity you are facing, no matter what trial you might be in, Christ is the one who restores all things to us. And he's asking for us, I believe today, to step out in boldness and faith, trusting that he is the one that can make us whole. You are significant because of him. No matter what your situation is, he can bring restoration.